Hi, welcome to The Composer's Mindset. I'm Bill Jordan, painter and composition apprentice with the Academy of Composition. Today I'd like to go over with you the first video in a series of 10 videos that the Academy has produced. The first video is for the artists. Those people who are visual arts who want to have the ability to consistently come up with great ideas. The goal, of course, is to unlock your mind to conceive these ideas on demand. The key is your ability to relate to more things. And the outcome is, once you start practicing these principles, you will come up with unique, insightful, and meaningful ideas on demand. And now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce the founder and director of the Academy of Composition, Victor Vargas. Thanks for the intro. You did a great job. Um, I like how you went through uh, the beginning of the video and explained what we can look forward to uh, receiving from the video and what our outcome will be. I'm Victor Vargas. Welcome, everyone, to the Academy of Composition, the training into the composer's mindset, specifically creativity. And so I just want to start off with a story about when I was a a wee little lad. And when I was a kid, there was this cool thing I kind of stumbled upon, which I call like the code of creativity or the formula for creativity. How, how, it, it just came to you intuitively? You saw someone do it? How did that work out? How did that work? Um, I don't like the idea that it, quote, came to me, you know, just came to me. Obviously, I probably seen it, picked up on it, you know, but at, at some point, there was a connection in my mind that was made. I was probably around 9, 10, maybe 11 at the latest when this happened. Um, and and I, I remember sitting at the kitchen table when I kind of figured it out. And uh, we had this big brown kitchen table um, back in Fleetwood, Pennsylvania. And... I was probably sketching and having a banana. We used to eat uh, banana and uh, peanut butter all the time. <laughs> and looking at the pencil and the banana, I kind of just thought to myself, well, why don't I just create this little exercise of relating these two? And so I challenged myself to come up with a, a whole variety of different ways of relating these two, these two things, the banana and the pencil. Can you give us an example? How, how do these things, what do they look like? In the beginning, it was very simple. It was maybe like I would draw a banana writing with a pencil, you know, a little cartoon banana. And then, I'm, then I flipped it, and I drew a little cartoon pencil that was eating a banana. You know? <laughs> so it was a little more literal. Um, but then ultimately it came into, like, looking at the color, relating the color, uh, relating the... The fact that the pencil and the banana come to a point, and at that point, it tends to be darker than the yellow pencil or the yellow banana. And so, in my imagination, I just merged those two. And so, if you can envision a banana coming down, transitioning into a pencil. And that was kind of cool. Um, and so, it was just these types of things. And so, that's when... I, I realized this little formula, all you got to do is figure neat ways of relating things that already exist. So you, you had kind of like a, a playfulness about it. You had sort of like a, you know, the mind of a child which plays with stuff and it was okay. You had no inhibitions about that. Exactly. It wasn't, um, there was no mysticism to it. There was no... Um, vagueness to it. It wasn't like, oh, I'm going to tap into this ancient, you know, cosmic secret. It was very simple. And in its simplicity, it's very, very powerful. What I learned is that you can trigger creativity on demand. Now, the first uh, ideas that you may get may not be very sophisticated or great, but you, but they are creative. And you can then explore them. And using composition, using the language of design, you can then push those ideas. In essence, it's just taking A and B and merging them together to give you C. It's, it's pretty simple. So is that is that unique to just our generation or 
is it just something that uh, other generations have used as well? Well, I mean, creativity is creativity. It's bringing two things together. So, for example, you know, let, let's think of like a caveman, right? There's rain, the Jew. How do you stop it? You know, <laughs> right? You put, okay. You put you put a leaf between you and the rain. You put a cave between you and the rain, or you and the wind, or whatever. You know, and so now you've your imagination has create created a solution to something in your mind created an idea and obviously then you have to build that idea out with your hands you have to actually make it happen and so this this is what we can expect during video one of the 10 part series exactly what we're going to look at is look at some uh, quotes because i like to look at quotes to kind of give us a mental model of where we can go with all this and, and what we're standing on so if we look at steve jobs he says creativity is connecting things. That's it. Really simple, pretty straightforward. In a weird way, it takes the romance out of it. Yeah, it does, you doesn't know? it? <laughs> um, right. But because it's so practical, what you're actually what you're able to create is very romantic. But your romance now has has a solid foundation because it's just very very practical. It's really the science, if you will, of creativity. Right. And on, on that platform, then we can build the art that comes from it, you know, and then a craft. Um, and Jack Franco said something very similar. And so he said creativity is taking known elements and putting them together in unique ways. And so he's tapping into the same formula that Steve Jobs did, that I have, and that many, many other people who are very confident in their ability to come up with ideas on a consistent basis and on demand have all come to, which is the simplicity of this idea that is you're just taking two or more things and putting them together in a unique way. So do you think that most people are aware of this simple formula? No. I think most people want to believe so hard that they're so special that they want to make this process of creating something into something it's not. They want it to be magical. They're waiting for that moment where it just happens or, you know, the universe explodes with inside of them and they have this this ability to create something that, that has never existed ever. And <laughs> right, right, right. And, and so uh -huh. when they can't do that, they become frustrated, I imagine, right? They do. But before we get into that, we'll, we'll talk about those things a little later in the video. Let me share this with you real quick. What we like to do in each of these videos is to create an icon for the video itself, a way for us to trigger the knowledge that we're, we're sharing. When it comes to creativity, the icon that we use for the composer's mindset is the centaur. And obviously the centaur is half man, half horse, and you merge them together and you have this really cool new quote-unquote creation, right? This, this new thing. Right. Now the reality is we didn't create anything. We composed it. We just merged two, two elements. That's right. We didn't create man. We didn't create a horse. We just rearranged them. We realigned them. We combined them. We altered it. We modified it. We composed it. And this is another revelation, if you want to call it, that I had when I was very young, which led me to winning over 100 awards in communication, visual communication, design, art, whatever you want to call it, was because I, I never believed I created anything. I always felt that my job was more of a tuning fork. And we'll get into this concept a little bit more in the next video, into inspiration, but it was much more of a tuning fork I was trying to understand what it was that wanted to be made. Right. Um, and so I saw myself as a composer, as someone who was arranging things that communicated something. I never saw myself as, as a creator. It was strange because the people, I, I would get in arguments like back in high school and college, you know, <laughs> over these concepts. And the people who were like, no, I'm creating, I'm creating they wouldn't win <laughs> you know and so it was strange it was like they were holding on to this idea that they that they that they were the creator of something 
That was just never really part of my mindset. I never really held on to that belief. And so I was always considered very creative. And it was very strange how I never saw myself as a creator. And therefore, I was, quote, very creative. And those who try so hard to be a creator struggle. And they become very frustrated with this inability to, quote, come up with a new idea, something brand new that never existed. So I guess then the icon... Is, is a very visual way of keeping us focused on the fact that we're blending two things together as an out, you know, and the outcome is, is something creative. Creativity is something that we can do, but it's a mental thing. It's a way of seeing something. And so it happens in this abstract, invisible place. It doesn't happen in the physical place. So we, we can be creative, but not a creator. Exactly. Uh, we have a still life. And in that still life, you want to have an interesting relationship with apples and a banana. One thing that we can do is add personification to the, to the apples and the banana. And that way, um, you know, maybe the, the two apples are kind of off to themselves. And they look like, you know, they, they, they kind of have this vibe of like, you know, maybe some little gossipy women like, oh, look at her, that skinny little, that skinny little banana flaunting her stuff as she walks down the street. Right. So you can have and now all I did was take one element, which was fruit. And I took another element, which was human personality and maybe a scenario where a, a judgment or jealousy of some sort and then I combined them all together. And, and I just did it on demand. It was very simple for me to do it um, and to trigger it because all I, I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel per se or, or you know, create the universe. All I'm trying to do is see how these different elements can relate to each other. So you, you do that in a playful way. Are there any examples that you can think of uh, in this video that would... Um, take it to a level where uh, we can see the difference between to create and compose? Yeah. So in the application area, we'll get into some of those examples. But what we were talking about is really the idea, and, and this is where the alchemy happens. Here, when you develop the composer's mindset, we want to free an artist into a new place. What we're developing here are composers. And we take great pride in calling ourselves a composer because there's great power in it. When we realize you can't create anything, to actually create something new is an impossible act. I mean, it's, it's, it's literally impossible to create something new. But we can compose new things all the time. That's what we... No other animal can do that. That's what one of the things that makes us so awesome and, and to be honest it's what makes us human right right you know we, we look at a tree you know a forest of trees and we say wow we can make paper and pencils we can build buildings and boats i mean we see all these trees and and, and our imagination says how can i make that tree you know support me my family and my tribe on the water well you know here's an amazing thing you're talking about not being a creator, not being a creator, but we can take stuff in, in the environment and modify it in such a way that we can get a, a new use out of it. Is that what you're talking about? Uh, absolutely. And what blows my mind, and, and this is when it really, really hit. A few years ago, I was in my brother's house, and um, his wife was in the kitchen working on the computer. He was in the computer room working on the computer. I was in the living room working on a computer. And we were putting together some uh, some advertisements. And so I finished the ad. I sent it over to him through Wi-Fi. Uh, actually, yeah, through Wi-Fi, so a wireless connection. He approved it. He sent it over to his wife. She looked over it, made sure, you know, all the grammar was right and everything. She approved it. And then she sent it, again, wirelessly to the printer. And that just blew my mind how working on the computer, I created something, quote unquote. What I did was compose an ad, 
it was sent invisibly through digits and ones and zeros this thing that was in my head now in the computer sent to my brother for him to engage with it sent it to his wife for her to engage it never was made physical and then she sends it to the printer and then it prints out physically right I'm right. like, whoa, it was such a freaky, amazing experience. But what was what was more amazing was to realize nothing, nothing that made that happen was created or, or, or existed now, let's say, that did not exist with cavemen. We right. didn't create some new element that never existed. You know, it wasn't like something fell from the, you know out of nowhere and now we had this amazing new element that gave us all this new power every single thing that we're doing us communicating through this internet connection everything cavemen had the ability not the ability but they had um the, the potential to tap into but all they had to do was figure out the code figure out the right sequence of arrangements of assembly of modifications of enhancements and edits you know, how to alter a rock, you know, to give them this, or how to connect in such a way to extract electricity, you know, all of these different things. And then to compose it all together in such a way that it then produces a whole new creature, a whole new thing, you know, our computers and the Wi-Fi connections and the systems and all So, you know, when, when you say it that way, I see why you, you maintain that creating is an impossible action because... The stuff that we use is just stuff that's already here. It's up to our imagination and how we arrange these different things that makes a new something. What what happens? I mean, obviously, your this difference, distinction you're making is, is a, it creates a sense of uh, makes a person free, liberates the person from from this from perfection. Would, would you say that? Uh, absolutely. So the same thing with perfection and versus greatness. We're going that what we're trying to do is move the composer now from trying to focus on producing something that's perfect and we want to move them into producing something that is great. And the main reason for this is because perfection isn't real in the world that we live. And so if we if we set our aim for something that's great or effective, that's achievable, and you, and it's achievable on a consistent basis. You can constantly do that for the rest of your existence. You will never ever ever achieve perfection. And so, if you don't want to waste your life in frustration, feeling like you're running in a rat race, the best way to do that when it comes to us creatives is stop pretending you're a creator and stop seeking after perfectionism change your mind become a composer because composers where the power is and aim for greatness or effectiveness because that's achievable you never created anything and it never was perfect so do you think that's why a lot of artists are frustrated because they seek perfection absolutely and there's a reason why I mean, you can't blame them. The nature of the artist, the artist has the ability to see into the invisible. And so they see things clearly as they ought to be. Then they try to express it into a work of art, or what we would call a composition. The problem is, is if you see this image of the prism. Right, okay. okay. What does it have to do with what we're talking about? Perfectionism exists, but it doesn't exist in our realm. What I mean by that is, perfection is two things. It is the source of all things, and it is the culmination of all things. The ideal is, is the, the beam of light on the left of the prism? Yes. And then, and, and then I, I, the artists or the people try to live in a diffused representation or letdown of that light on the right. Absolutely. And so one you could say is the ideal, the other is the reality, right? Okay. And and that's why it's so frustrating for artists and also just people in general because we're both. We can see the idea, we can see the light, we can see the perfection, but then we live in this reality and the reality it can't because it, it's composed of constraints. Time, matter, space, resource. And, and so therefore, you have to make a decision. You can't have it all. You have to make a decision. Well, now, you say that 
a composer says, I have to make it great. And I, you're saying then that because the composer takes two things and puts them together, that makes something great? Uh, not necessarily. There's a dialogue that occurs in this process. And so when you're composing things, you have to ask yourself a question. If you're composing it for yourself, then you want to know what is it that you want? What is it, what, what, what pleases you? So you have to know yourself. For example, I love a black lab. Um, I also love collies. So I would be happy with a purebred of either, but because it would hit my personality, I also think it'd be kind of cool if I had a dog that was a combination of them. So if you took a black lab and you took a collie and you brought them together, you have this long-haired lab-looking thing, which would be really, really cool. Right. But it would be cool to me because it's... it. it it affects my worldview. It, it affects the way I, I see things. There's also a lot of meaning behind the black dog um, for, for me. If, if that dog came out purple, I'd be like, well, that would actually be kind of cool too. But let's say <laughs> <laughs> if it came out hairless and, and, and brown, it wouldn't speak to me as much. But for somebody else, man, that could be a great, great dog. Right. right? As the composer, when we're composing things either in our life or on our canvas or whatever, there is a dialogue. We have to be honest with ourselves. We have to know what we want. And if we're composing something for someone else, then we need to be we need to know how to get them to be honest so that they can tell us what they want, so we can compose accurately and make make, make it great. And realizing that we're not going to make it perfect. This video that we're making is not going to be perfect. But it sure is going to be a great video, and it's going to help a lot of people. And so just to kind of wrap up this idea of the perfection and art and creating, it's interesting when we approach our artwork that we don't really want to seek perfection because, one, we're just going to get frustrated and run around in circles. I find it very cool that Renoir talked about this, and he said, The desire for perfection destroys art. And so it's just something to take with you and to set yourself free from this burden, this anxiety of trying to make things perfect and to understand that we, we cannot live and we should never, ever, ever live with the idea of perfection as, as, as a guiding force in our life because it will only destroy our art. And if you apply it to your life or your relationships, you know, let's say you have a child you want the perfect son or the perfect daughter or the perfect yeah, right. right the perfect relationship between mom and, and daughter or whatever it is you will destroy it because you're imposing onto it something that is impossible and is not for this realm it's not you know now that the way you put it like that it makes makes good sense i would even dare to say it makes great sense <laughs> <laughs> right because you compose it well <laughs> so now how do we apply this stuff to our artwork and that's what we're going to talk about now. Now, I'm going to show you a couple strategies to triggering creativity. It doesn't mean that it's the only strategies, but just a couple to kind of stimulate your thinking. Cause okay, go, I'm open. Go right ahead. Okay, so one of the strategies, and you can see the little fawn guy over here in the picture. One of the strategies, like we talked about earlier, is just to combine stuff. So, for example, again, using the icon of this uh, video, the centaur. He's, you know, he's a man, he's horse, you merge them together. The fawn is a man and a goat, and you merge him together. Angels are half man, half eagle, the wings of an eagle. And so if you look at this painting of the fawn, you see the fawn who's half man, half goat. He's playing an instrument, so there's music brought into the mix. Is he playing an instrument to people? No. He's playing it to the little woodland creatures. And so what we have here are a couple a couple elements, known elements. We, we, we know that men exist. We know goats exist. We, we know rabbits exist and music exists. And the setting exists, right? There's trees, snow, that kind of thing. And so what we're doing to be, quote, creative is we're combining all these things. We're relating them in a unique way. And so the unique way would be to bring in this goat, half goat, half man. We also bring in musicality into it. Now, we never created a man. We never created a goat. We never created music. We never created rabbits, <laughs> you know, or snow or trees. 
So what is this? This is not an act of creation. This is an act of composition. Right. Another strategy to triggering creativity is to inhabit something. And so if you look at this Dali painting of Christ being the bread of life, and then, you know, it's kind of cool that the bread is with inside of him, but he's also with inside of Mary. It's pretty profound. It's, it's a pretty cool concept. That, that's yeah, really it creative. is. It's, it is. And yet, we didn't invent bread. We didn't invent baby and mama and the baby being inside mama. And, and when you eat, things go inside you. We didn't invent that. We didn't, I mean, not invent. We didn't create any of that. Mm. But we're bringing all these elements. You know, he has the book. He has a ball. I'm not sure what the ball is. You know, maybe he's a basketball player. I don't know. But we bring all this stuff together and we compose. This is, again, not an act of creation. This is an act of composition. You know, and and to add on to that, we didn't create color either. No. You know, the, the things that make up the, the pigments, mm-hmm. but the way this person, the way Dali has used them, gives us a good feeling, and it's it's uh, I guess unique onto his view of of reality, and he composed them in a certain way that gives us this message. Yeah, and and so other other ideas would be you know let's say you have a living room. And you bring a tree from the outside inside. Now, to me, that's a great idea. That's awesome. I saw, <laughs> you know, I, I've seen, I had a friend when I was in high school who had a tree inside his house. That, that's just really, really cool. Now, you could get even, quote, more creative, which is just, again, you've related, you've inhabited a, a tree from the, which lives on the outside and you brought it inside your home. That's creative. You get more creative when you when you relate another layer of thought. So, what kind of tree? I would love a citrus tree, a lemon tree. Could you imagine? <laughs> right? right, right. Again, that has meaning to me, too. So, it, it brings a whole other thing. <clears throat> and so, I'm relating and combining, inhabiting, and that's why it becomes a really creative idea. And again, it can be triggered on demand once you understand how to approach it. So, have anything else? Oh, I got a couple things. One of my favorite ways of doing, uh, of triggering creativity is through emoting, um, specifically emotions. Rockwell said one of the keys to his success was his ability to make an image have two emotions. You can trigger creativity when you bring two emotions into a composition. Uh-huh. Okay, so again, we're relating two things. In this case, it's emotions. We're, we're, we're trying to trigger in the audience two simultaneous um, reactions. And so when you look at this image, you see the joy of the community. The mom, the dad may be up on top of the roof. Um, everyone's so excited, and they're exploding with joy because the soldier came home from war. So this painting is called Homecoming. But if you notice over in the left-hand corner, on the side of the building, that girl ain't exploding joy. (laughs) Right? She's hiding. She's waiting her turn. She's, you know, it's funny. um, As humans, we have this very strange phenomenon that when we love something, we don't want to touch it. You know? Like, if you were younger, um, the girl that you were really, really attracted to, you right. wouldn't touch. But you wouldn't mind, you know, hitting everybody else, you know, in the party. <laughs> but, like, you you know, you kind of held that back, you know. Um, and so in this painting, you have that tension, you know. He's standing vertical, if you notice where he is. And above him, there's the tree. And, I mean, it's just a very strong vertical line from bottom to top or top right. to bottom. Um, that's part of composition. So he is strong. Everyone is coming to him. And the other strong vertical is where she is. Again, right. from top to bottom, right? Um, and so she's being very, very still. And it's this beautiful tension. But everything around them is moving in excitement and joy because he came home. But the two of them remain very, very still. Those are two different emotions. And they're two different expressions of love. There's this outpouring of love and joy that the guy's home. There's another one that's 
being reserved because it's a more of a passionate and and it would be inappropriate for her to you know explode and him to explode. Right, right. <laughs> because they're not married. Exactly. Yes. We have two more to go through real quick. Um, another strategy is to liken something, or we can use metaphors, which is basically one thing representing another. Visually, we can use metaphors, and so you see Saint Francis here. This is actually a very powerful piece when you get into the representation, the meaning, the metaphor behind everything. So you see the skull on the top of the table. You see the book. So he's, he was reading, but the book is closed. The skull, you know, he was contemplating death. His shoes are, interestingly, at the bottom of where he was sitting. This stems back from Moses where he took his sandals off when he came, I think, to the burning bush. So the idea is that when you come into a place of holiness, you take your shoes off, right? Right. So, if this is St. Francis, he's known for having the stigmata on his feet and his hands. And if you notice, he doesn't have stigmata yet. So this is the moment before he comes into this miracle. And we cut half the painting off to fit it into this slide, but on the other side you see the trees moving, <clears throat> the clouds moving, everything's leaning in towards him. Because it's the invisible presence of God coming to him in this moment of this miracle. And so it, this is an amazing painting. Even like the jug that's behind him, you know, it's about ready to overflow. Yeah, and right. There's, just, there's a spring, I think, down at the bottom that's that's just starting to come out with water. There's all of these little representations um, that are metaphors for what's going on uh, in this moment. And so metaphor is another way to trigger creativity. Hmm. Okay, the jug represents the filling of someone's soul, you know. Um, the skull represents death. So you're thinking death, you have the skull, and you're merging them together. <clears throat> now what's interesting is there's actually a book, and I love this book, I found it when I was in university, and it's called The Signs and Symbols in Christian Art by uh, George Ferguson. And it goes through... And it tells you what does the B mean. Um, it's actually interesting when you see bees in um, uh, in Christian art. It's the representation of the church or the Christians because they used to say back in the day that the Christians were so industrious, so productive, so always working, always busy. Uh -huh. so they were busy like a bee, and right. you know, and so and also because they had these tight-knit communities that they were forming they were like colonies and cells and they you know it, it was really fascinating the fly represents the presence of satan you know so <laughs> fly on top of some dead food or whatever it is you know so it's interesting it just goes through like it, it tells you all of these flowers what flowers means the lily means the mother mary you know all these things so it's, it's pretty cool and if you're into that kind of stuff and you want to understand the metaphors that are in these paintings this is an amazing investment get this book so our last strategy that we're going to talk about is juxtaposition i love juxtaposition because i just love saying the word um <laughs> juxtaposition simply means um putting one thing next to another like how does it relate to to each other okay and I like it because that deals with creativity. So there, there, there are different things that we can illustrate or compose or communicate when composing a work of art. Um, we could use a principle, like the whole idea of love the enemy, right? right. Love your enemy. So those, are, those ideas juxtaposed are kind of opposites. You know, how do you love and, and uh, you know, and someone who hates you, your enemy? Um, and so that's a great thing to think about. And then also, how do you, and then you, you ask yourself, how do you visually represent that? How do you make, communicate that visually? Um, you could tackle an idea, the idea of good versus evil. In this case, where Van Gogh is, or Van Gogh some would like to say um, he's juxtaposing value and color so if you look at his head his head is very light but his body and, and the background is, is a very dark so it's a right. light figure on a dark background that's a juxtaposition 
you see the warmth in his beard, but you see the the large amount of cool colors in the back, in the background. Um, but he's also bringing some of that warmth into the background. This combination of using these warms and cools, this is another way of juxtapos uh, juxtaposing each other or using juxtaposition to trigger something that's creative. So this is this is an amazing painting. It is, right. Very, very strong. What I'd like you guys to do, use the worksheets and the exercises that are provided, go through them. First exercise is gonna give you a list of words and I just want you to come up, you know, write out or sketch out different ways that you can relate the two, just like the banana and the pencil. And then the worksheets, you might want to go through this video again, listen to the concepts, watch the slides, and then fill the blanks in. So Bill, would you like to run through a, a quick recap of what we discussed and uh, regarding creativity? Sure, creativity is our ability to join or relate two different elements in life. It's, and in our context, it's for, it's for those artists who want to make the transition from being an artist who is working, seeking perfection to a composer's mindset, which is the ability to actually have these creative spurts on demand, not have to wait for something to happen to you. you by the way you compose things, you have your instant creativity. And I think that video one, uh, we've shown you how this can happen for you. And it's a great place to start, bearing in mind the fact that creativity is your ability to relate to something else, not the fact that you have to be the creator, thereby taking off the frustration, the stress, and trying to be perfect. You do what you do based upon the principles of composition. And this video principle is the ability to compose or to, to relate two or more things together. I think that's basically where we are today. Would, would you agree with me, Victor? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, so, awesome. ladies and gentlemen, you know, this is the the end of video one. The next video we're going to look at is video two. It's concept inspiration.